Well, thank you once again, and thank you, panelists, for inviting me. Thank you, Ferran, for inviting me. Um, yes, and what I'm going to try to do, it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, the, the, the problem with um, intellectual academic presentations uh, is that there are always two fallacies attached to them, two opposite fallacies. Either you repeat yourself, in other words, you say things that you've said many times, and you have to look like it's the first time you're saying it, like you're thinking about it as you say it. That's one of the tricks. But then there are these rare moments when you are actually saying, <laughs> saying something that you haven't said before. And in that case, you have to pretend exactly the opposite, like you've said it before, and that you master what you're going to say. So I'm in one of these rare second category moment with you, so you're going to have to uh, deal with this kind of attempt at weaving, weaving three things. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about what Carlos invited me to speak about originally, which is this project called François, which you see uh, behind me. Then I'm going to move from that to what is my <coughs> current work, uh, current solo book uh, in progress on what I call the neoliberal condition. And then at the confluence of this project and my own research and work, there is a budding project in preparation, which is what I'm going to talk about ultimately. Um, and that project is very much at its incipient stage, so that's where I'm going to have to ask you to be um, tolerant with me uh, since it will be the first time that I will be talking about it. So the question is to make sense of the three. Cette France-là was um, a collective, a collaborative project that was started in 2007 in France. And we were a group of about 25, 30 um, academics, journalists, activists of all types. Uh, we had sociologists, economists, legal scholars. I was the odd man philosopher. Uh, no, there was another one. Anyway, but also journalists and people who had experience in immigration uh, activism in particular and also healthcare activism. So the idea was this. Um, Nicolas Sarkozy was elected in 2007, and the issue of immigration was particularly prominent in his program. So, and of course, with very strong xenophobic overtone. Um, at the same time, it was presented as a very modernist and uh, open project. So there was a strange mix or schizophrenic approach uh, in the discourse of Sarkozy. What he was saying basically was this, was that uh, France was, of course, a very open country, uh, very universalist, very much based on Republican values, and so it was very open to other cultures, to other kind of people. It was, of course, very much against any form of racism and xenophobia very much against any form of communitarian uh, spirit. So that was France. The problem was that foreigners are not like that, especially non-European foreigners. You know, they're not so open. Um, they are communitarianists, and they're also sexist, and they're also sometimes anti-Semitic. I mean, especially the Muslim ones are the ones who come from really far away. So the discourse was, if we want to keep France open, we have to close it. And that was the dispositif, as it were, of that kind of policy, that in the name of universalist value, in the name of Republican values, there was a tougher and tougher xenophobic policy. So the general idea was to expose that and to show that something was happening. That through this discourse on immigration, uh, the 
a vaster, a bigger neoliberal project was into place. Uh, it was neoliberal in the sense that uh, at the same time that capital could flow freely in and out of the country, immigration was curtailed more and more. So there was kind of a transfer. Like, we cannot protect you against capital flow, but we can protect you against families from Mali. So let's not say that the state cannot protect its citizen anymore. It can only against certain things, against menace that are, to a large extent, imaginary. But precisely because they are imaginary, they're easier to solve than the ones that are actually real. Right? So, through the prism of immigration, a whole project was sold to France. And it seemed to work. And so the idea was to expose it. And at the time, we still had a rather optimistic outlook that people could be convinced. And by, by people, I mean not only the left, but even sort of a soft liberals, like people in the socialist parties, uh, or even some Christian Democrats by like, calling on to their Christian feelings and values against this sort of dangerous and perverse turn of democracy that was the undemocratization of liberal democracy, where the immigration policy was the central element of the project. And so that's why we decided to first publish these uh, huge uh, I, I never had images and now I know why. How do you go down? How do you go down? Ah, here. Um, so we started with this huge volume and then this one. And then later on uh, just before the campaign of 2012, we published two shorter essays to sort of be active during the electoral campaign. And so the general idea of this project was it was a fourfold um, project. Um, the idea was to show what the immigration policy do to migrants, but also to show what this immigration policy does to the French state and even to the French population and also to wonder about what is the rationale, what is the rationality of this ongoing policy. So there, was, there were two parts that were devoted to portraits. Portraits of undocumented migrants um, who had either been expelled or were in the process of being expelled or sometimes had been finally regularized after much travail. So we had their pictures when they authorized us to put their picture on. And then the story of their, their story and the story of their encounter with the French administration. But then in parallel with that, we also had portraits of the préfet, meaning the representative of the executive power in France who are in charge of the immigration policy on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the main characteristics of Sarkozy's policy was to give to delegate more and more power to these préfets. These préfets are not elected, they're nominated. And so it was easy to sort of delegate the dirty work to these préfets as representative of the state. So since these people operate usually uh, in the background, the idea was to forefront them by having portraits of them with their picture and with their record uh, as far as immigration policy is concerned. So this was the two portrait parts. And then, there was two other parts, one which was about describing the whole machinery of this immigration policy, basically from the presidential speech to the prime minister's speeches to the way the Ministry of Immigration, at the time there was a Ministry of Immigration, operated, how the police operated, how the judicial system operated, how the various um, social services operated vis-a-vis the migration policy, and even how this was delegated to the population in a certain way, or at least how the population was engulfed or invited to participate in this xenophobic policy. 
So that was another big part of the project. And the last part was an essay, um, sort of reflecting on why this now and what is the rationale of this policy. <coughs> so that was the, the, the project of, of Cette François. So, um, but it was not only about publishing a book, it was also kind of an activist and lobbyist uh, action. So, for instance, with the fourth volume, and these you can't see them very well here, but they were sort of big, hardcover, 600-page books. They were kind of massive bricks. And so, for the first volume, we sent one copy uh, to every member of government, to every member of parliament, to all the high-ranking officials in France plus a media campaign that accompanied it, and which was pretty successful. Um, and then we did the same thing with the second one, of course. You know, you cannot repeat things and have the same success twice. So the second one was less of a success, but the reason why it was less of a success was because we started another initiative at the same time. Uh, thanks to the success of the first one, we managed to be in contact with members of parliament, meaning at the National Assembly, at the Senate, at the European Parliament. And so we managed to gather a group of about 30 to 40 members of parliament to, and convince them to um, conduct an audit of the immigration policy. Because one of the main lines of our books was not only that this policy is disgusting and xenophobic, but also that it is not rational if we call rational the rationality that is forwarded. Yes, there was a rational, I mean, a political rationale, a political rationality to what was being implemented, which is what I described earlier on. But this is not how the policy was presented. The policy, as you know, was, as I told you, was presented as this is the way to keep French society open. This is also the way to optimize immigration policy in terms of economics. This is also a way to optimize French immigration policy in relation to the rule of law. So the point was to show that all these claims are false. Right? <coughs> the immigration policy is more costly than immigration itself. In fact, there is no economic problem attached to immigration in France, and it's very easy uh, to prove. And, uh, most serious economists uh, show it, even if they're not particularly leftist. So that's how we convince members of parliament to come in and to do this kind of serious and rigorous audit. And it was very funny uh, because the, when we published the first volume, um, because of the big media thing, I was invited on TV to speak about it. And so I was greeted by the TV journalist before he interviewed me, and he said, you know, I just received it three days ago, uh, and I haven't had time to read it, so we're going to have to talk about it, but you know, I have basically looked at it. But the good thing was that in the newspaper, uh, there had been this big article about us saying how incredibly rigorous this thing was. It was not only a militant book, but sort of a scientifically rigorous book. So the journalists started saying, well, you just wrote an extremely rigorous book scientifically, not only a militant book, so repeating what the journalist had said, even though he hadn't read it. And so it became kind of the mantra, oh, these people are rigorous, right? Nobody read it, of course, but we had the reputation. So that's how we managed to get this member of parliament to organize this audit. We even got one or two weird uh, members of parliament from the Sarkozy party, from the right, to be part of the audit. I mean, they left relatively quickly from the group, but at least we had their names on the, on, the, on the audit. And so we conducted this audit where we invited experts of all sorts to come to um, parliamentary commission and report on various aspects of the immigration policy. So we did that, and then uh, just before the election of 2012, when Sarkozy was defeated by Hollande, we did something slightly different, which was to publish this time two short books. One book of portraits, <coughs> portraits again of prefet and of migrant, and also uh, an essay, which was just an essay about 
the rationale of this policy and why it was really urgent to change it. Well, these two books, we're, we're very proud of them. They were uh, a total failure because um, we had bad luck, if you can say that. Um, there again, we had prepared a big media campaign. But the problem was that the book, the two books came out just as there was this horrible crime in Toulouse uh, where uh, a young man of Algerian descent killed young Jewish kids in a Jewish school, and also a couple of French soldiers, and so of course that was a huge drama. But from that point on, it was very clear that even on the left, at a time when it seemed that Hollande was going to win and Sarkozy was going to lose, nobody wanted to touch the issue of immigration. I mean, especially if you wanted Sarkozy to lose, you didn't want to take a chance and push the issue of immigration. So basically, nobody talked about these books during the campaign. So that was the depressing end of the Cette France-là project. So then after that, um, as you know, Hollande was elected, the socialists came to power. And uh, we thought we could have a little respite, not that we had great hopes, but we could have a little respite um, and at least go back to our own specific work in the group. Unfortunately, there was no respite, absolutely nothing changed. If anything, uh, things got worse since the socialists have been back in power. Um, at the same time, we were a little bit burned out uh, as far as immigration policy was concerned, especially because nothing changed. I mean, after all, we had put a lot of effort in explaining how it works. What's the rationale? And basically, as far as writing is concerned, we had nothing to add, right? Um, except that it was really disgusting that the socialists were just as bad with immigration as with everything else as the right. But, you know, how, how many books can you write uh, just adding these two sentences? So we stopped for a while, and so I went back a little bit to my own work. Um, but then, with my own work, and also with the work of some of my friends in the group, another project emerged, which is a project that I'm going to talk about uh, now, but not without pre having it preceded by a little presentation of my own concern and how I went from this project at Francois to the new one. As Carlos uh, told you, what I'm working on is um, the advent of what I call a neoliberal condition. Or, to put it in a different, different terms, the current state of capitalism in our country. And what it does, what it does to states, what it does to corporations, what it does to people. And my claim is that there is a remarkable and incredibly deep shift that has happened in contemporary, in contemporary capitalism, or capitalism since the 1980s. Of course, I'm far from being the only one to say that, but uh, it seemed to me that there is some kind of an anthropological shift that has happened. By that, I mean this. It seems to me that every form of government is correlated with a certain representation of the human condition. What I mean by that is this, is that to govern others, to make it legitimate to govern others, you have to assume that they're not capable of governing themselves. Otherwise, why would you have the right to govern them? And when you make the claim that they cannot govern themselves, that means that you must have a representation of how people behave when they are not governed. Which means that uh, it's based on that representation of how people behave when they are not governed that you will be justified in governing them. The bad tendencies that they have is what government should ward off, should mend. 
the good tendencies that they have naturally are the ones that should be promoted. So, in a way, a representation of the human condition is important um, and crucial for government, whether it's implicit or explicitly preferred, as both a justification of why people should be governed, but also how they should be governed. The good government is a government that wards off the bad disposition and fosters the good one. Right? So that's a very quick, broad, and schematic uh, presentation of the theoretical framework. And it seems to me that something, and I'll try to make it as short as I can to move on to the third part of what I'm going to be saying, uh, something very complicated has happened let's say, between the end of the Second World War to today. At the end of the Second World War, the general form of government was predicated on what could be called a liberal condition, which is basically the idea that uh, people try to maximize their satisfaction. It's, in a way, a, in part at least, a utilitarian notion. But not only because some satisfactions are not purely utilitarian. So, the, the way that welfare capitalism <coughs> operated was the following. The way that welfare capitalism operated was that um, what was a corporate manager job and what was a prime minister or a president's job, a government's job. The job was that you had capital on one hand and you had labor on the other hand. <coughs> and the idea was to make sure that they could both maximize, optimize at least their satisfaction on their constraints. And it was important that they were both happy enough because if we were still in a phase of largely industrial capitalism, capitalism and so if workers would go on strike, that would destroy the whole uh, economic machinery. So they had a leverage. And of course, if people with money would withdraw their money from companies, then the economy would fall apart again. So the idea for good government, but it was also the same for a good corporate manager, was, on the one hand, to keep both capital owners and uh, workers and employees happy by giving sufficient wage raise to the workers and sufficient dividends to the capital owner, but also to convince both of them that they should not be too greedy, that they should not be demand too much, because their future satisfaction was predicated on the fact that enough of the income of the country or of the company would be reinvested. The reinvestment would make it for higher salary tomorrow, higher dividends tomorrow. And that rationale of compromise and of social compromise was possible, well, mainly for one reason, which was steady growth. It was a time with the reconstruction after the war where growth was exceptional. There's a French economist, Thomas Piketty, who's having a huge success with his book, Capital in the 21st Century, which has basically one idea, and that idea is that the moment of steady growth of the post-war period until the 70s was an exceptional moment in the history of capitalism. Uh, it's not likely to happen again soon. So, that went on fine until the late 60s, early 70s. When all of a sudden, for various reasons, I'm not going to get into it now, but we can have a discussion, uh, growth started to come to a plateau. But at the same time, people, both on the capitalist side and on the labor side, had been accustomed to a steady progress of their well-being of their satisfaction of their payment. So the demands were the same, but 
the ability to deliver on this demand was not the same. So the 70s was a period which was called a period of stagflation. Stagflation because it was stagnation, no more steady growth, but inflation because the demands were still there, people would still demand a wage increase and still demand to have steady, steady dividend if they had capital, and the government, for fear of a social crisis, would deliver. So you would have inflation, prices would go up. And the main reason, the, the main result for that was what was called, could be called the credit crunch. Right? There was not enough capital to distribute to everybody. And at the time, there was a group of economists, a very group of economists. Uh, some were the German Ordo Liberal School. Some was an Austrian economist called Friedrich Hayek. And some of the most famous probably were the Chicago School of Economics and mostly Milton Friedman. And these had been very marginal economists from the 1940s when they formed a group with Montpellier Society to the 70s. They had been considered extremists in their pro-market stance at a time when it was a time of social compromise. And all of a sudden, these people made themselves heard. Because basically what they told government is, you know, why don't you take advantage of the situation? In other words, not much growth, but multiple demands to just withdraw and let the market distribute the credit. Because look, they were saying to government, I mean, you're in a no-win situation, right? You have demands coming from labor and demands coming from capital. You have demands coming from local government and demands coming from uh, national governments. You have demands coming from the uh, real estate industry and you have demands coming from industrial capitalism. You have demands from households and you have demands from companies. And each time you surrender to someone's demand, all the others are unhappy. So there are only two possibilities. Either you decide that you're going to regulate who gets what when and then you've become a socialist uh, government. Or the, only, the other way out is just withdraw and let the market decide who gets the credit. The market, they said, is a great disciplinarian. The market will teach people to be disciplined. They will know that since they cannot count on the state anymore, they have to rely on themselves. Right? The great uh, rhetoric of Margaret Thatcher is that everybody should be like my parents. Not my parents, Margaret Thatcher's parents. And who were Margaret Thatcher's parents? They were shopkeepers who knew how to run on a tight budget. They knew that they shouldn't spend more than what they had earned. They knew how to save, and that was the right way to go. And governments, at a moment of kind of desperation because of the stagflation, things and well, no okay, bad. Let's try that. And so, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and then little by little in the rest of the world, the neoliberal program was adopted. Interestingly enough, uh, it was adopted even before Thatcher and Reagan came to power. The major reform was started in England in the 70s under the Labour government of Callaghan and in the United States under the Democratic administration of Jimmy Carter. But nonetheless, there was a huge boost uh, when Thatcher and Reagan came to power. So, was the neoliberal dream or utopia realized? Did everybody become this sort of thrift-oriented, running on a tight budget entrepreneurs that was imagined by the neoliberal theory? Because the whole idea of the neoliberal was that everybody should be an entrepreneur, not only entrepreneurs. Their thing was that what even liberal economists, even of their ilk, meaning Liberal, economic liberal uh, economists had missed was that they only had counted on companies, on entrepreneurs to be entrepreneurs or to act like that. And so now, in order to ward off socialism and in order to get out of the crisis, what was needed would be that everybody, no matter what you do in life, becomes sort of a 
self-managing entrepreneur in his or her life. That everything should be a question of cost and benefit and calculation of what is the cost of what I'm going to do and what is the benefit. There was some radical neoliberal, someone like Gary Baker, who died recently, for whom every aspect of a person's life should be perceived in that way. When I decide to marry or not to marry, well, it's a cost-benefit kind of decision. When I decide that I'm going to stop smoking or not, that I'm going to join the gym or not, that I'm going to study or decide to stay at home or decide to go for a job or just deal drugs, these are all cost-benefit calculation, and they should be seen like that, and public policies should be constructed as if people behave like that. They were not so stupid as to believe that everybody thinks like that all the time. But if public policies are constructed in such a way that people are assumed to behave like that, well, then it will become self-fulfilling prophecy, and people are actually going to become behave like that. And you going to be able to implement and design public, public policies accordingly. So now the question is, did that neoliberal dream of everybody become the entrepreneur of his or herself, that everybody would treat his or her life as his or her business in every sense of the world? I mean, the liberal sense, my life is my business, but the neoliberal sense, my life is my business, so therefore it's a cost-benefit kind of calculation. Did that happen? Well, in fact, no, not at all. And that's the interesting thing that has happened, and that's where the shift happened. Because why didn't it happen? Well, the government did what the neoliberals said they should. They withdrew, and they let the market deal with who would get the credit. So company wants credit, household wants credit. It's the market that will decide who can get the credit. And since there was not very much credit, the <coughs> interest rate went high up, which of course created a big recession at the turn of the 1980s. But not as big and not as bad as one could have expected. <coughs> Why? For two reasons. First of all, as they were withdrawing from uh, public spending, they also lower taxes on capital. One reason. Second reason, at the very moment that they withdrew and they let the interest rate go to the roof, they opened the border to the circulation of capital. So for foreign capital, meaning, and when I say they, I mean first England and the United States, the rest of the northern countries followed suit in the next few following year. But first in the UK and the US. They opened the border to capital. Which meant that for foreign capital, Japanese capital, which is at the moment of boom of their, of their industrial cap capitalism phase, but also uh, the so-called petrodollars of uh, the Middle East. So there was this huge amount of capital that were in various parts of the world. And so, of course, they went to the UK and, and the US because high interest rates, low taxes, what's not to like? So, of course, capital flew to the UK and flew to the US. And so, all of a sudden, you went from credit crunch to credit abundance, right? So, of course, because of the credit abundance, the interest rate started slowly to go down. So credit became more accessible. But it was not only that. <coughs> because the interest rates were high, companies decided, instead of investing in what they were supposed to produce, to use their finance on the financial market where the interest rates were so much higher than in the production of actual commodities. And since at the same time emerging economies were developing in the world, well, you could out and the technology was developing in such a way that you could outsource easily, well, the outsourcing movement started. And because of the outsourcing movement, and because of the high interest rate, labor income became very stagnant. In other words, people who lived from their wages uh, 
their income was stagnant. Yes, the income was stagnant, but credit was accessible. So you couldn't count on the progression of your salary to buy a car, to buy a house, and all that. Right? You could count on credit and the access to credit to buy a house, buy a car, and so forth. So what we had all of a sudden, at every level, the level first of companies. Companies for whom the whole idea was not to maximize profit by producing commodities anymore, but to maximize the value of their stock, their asset. In other words, to be attractive to investors since credit was abundant so that they could borrow, so that new shareholders would come or new lenders would come. So a real shift in the governance of companies Companies didn't try to maximize their profit in the long run anymore, as a good industrial company of the past would do, but they would try to maximize the value of their asset in the short run, because it's when your stock goes up that investors come to you because you become an attractive company. But the same thing happened for people too. You could not come count on the progress of your income to have a better life, but you could count on the accessibility of credit to have a better life. So you had to turn yourself into someone to whom one would lend money. So you had to mold your conduct so that you would be credit worthy. The point was not to save for later because I want my income and thus my satisfaction to progress and to improve over the course of my life. My issue is to mold my conduct and to behave in such a way that I will be attractive to investors now. Investors meaning lenders who are going to lend me the money so that I can buy my house. But the same thing happens not only on the consumer side of people, but also on the labor side of people. Since tax, taxes were low, and companies were mostly investing in uh, the, the financial market, then of course the, and the main point was to attract investors. And if there is something that investors like, it's low labor costs. <coughs> cost of labor is low. So all countries were making sure that the cost of labor would be as low as possible, the taxes on capital would be as low as possible, and that the country would be attractive to investors. Right? So therefore, the state couldn't offer what it used to offer, which is full employment. What it could offer was services so that people would make themselves not employed, by the employable. So then again, you have to adopt the proper conduct to maximize your employability in the eyes of investors. So just as for company, for people also, the goal was not maximizing satisfaction, that is to say maximizing profit or income, but it was about maximizing their own capital value. What is your own capital value? Is your ability to borrow. It's the credit that you receive. So I won't get into that, but I mean there is a relationship where you can make an, an homology, an analogy between profit and satisfaction in the old liberal regime and credit and self-esteem in the new regime. In other words, what I do is try to construct myself so that I will be credit-worthy. And the credit that I receive, that I receive boosts my self-esteem. And if my self-esteem is boosts, that might very well attract more credit. So the idea is to create a virtuous circle of that sort. And of course, that is true for corporation, who corporations that are staking their success in the immediate appreciation 
of their stock and not in their long-term profitability. It is true in the case of people, individuals, who are also trying to maximize their creditworthiness and their employability now, rather than staking their happiness or their prosperity in the slow progress of income that is not progressing anyway. And it's, of course, the same thing for the states, too. Because the states, of course, in order to make themselves attractive for investing, in order to make their territories attractive to investors, have to lower the cost of labor, have to lower taxes, have to do everything that investors like. But of course, if they do that, then they don't have much tax revenues anymore, so they don't have much to spend on their constituents. And that could be a problem, because there's a time where the constituents could be really fed up with not having public services and public goods anymore. So what do the state do in order to at least continue to distribute a modicum of uh, what they used to distribute as a welfare state? Well, the state also borrow on the financial market, which means that as soon as they borrow on the financial market in order to pay for their services, they also have to adapt their conduct to what the financial market like. So government are in a situation where they are caught between their constituents, who give them their job by electing them, and the people who finance their budget, who are the financial market. But the difference between the two is that the people vote every four or five years, whereas the financial market vote every nanosecond. Which means that clearly what policy is about is about convincing people that following the orders of the financial market is the only thing that we can do. Right. So there you have that, that system. Do I have another 10 minutes? Yeah. No. OK, so that's the general system. So what you have is really, I think, a remarkable anthropological shift. Neoliberalism was sold as a regime that would turn us, turn us all into self-entrepreneur, right? We would be like Margaret Thatcher's parents, managing our budget. Right? In fact, it didn't turn us into people who treat life as their business, but into people who treat life as their portfolio. In other words, my conduct, what I do, what I decide, what I choose, are valuable in as much as it gives me credit eventually on the financial market, even if I don't have direct access to the financial market. Making myself employable for a company means that I will be attractive for the company, but what does it mean to be attractive for the company? Is to give the kind of skills that the people who finance the company like. So eventually, the people who call the shop are not the employers are not the entrepreneurs, but are the investors. We went from an employer's capitalism to an investor's capitalism. The shift to the financial market is there. But it creates a real anthropological shift in the way we conceive of our life, in the way we are constructed and we construct ourselves. So, in other words, from profit to credit, from satisfaction to self-esteem. But then, having worked on that and having presented that part, in that part, I'm repeating myself, trying to pretend that I'm saying it for the first time. But, uh, having repeated that part a few times, I often had the question, the following question, which I think is a very pertinent question, which is, Okay, you describe our current life, or contemporary life, as a portfolio, right? A portfolio of either assets or securitized debt that we try to sort of manage in order to have the highest possible value of the portfolio. But okay, but there are millions and billions of people on this planet who just don't have a portfolio at all, or whose portfolio are just worthless. So, your neoliberal condition, that's maybe the case for uh, a minority of people, and even a relatively disenfranchised minority of people, but there are people 
beyond that or below that? I think it's a pertinent question. And though I would not totally agree, I think that the point is this, is that we are all portfolios, except that some portfolios are worthless. I mean, think of Lehman Brothers in 2008, right, the bank that went corrupt. So some people are considered not credit worthy at all. Some people are considered not employable at all. That is the point that the great absent of this conference, as you may be, is making uh, by saying that the problem today is not, I mean, the main problem today is not exploitation or even over-exploitation, but it's the people who are not even exploitable. And the fact that people ask to be exploited shows that there is something much worse than exploitation, which is to be unexploitable. Well, my translation of the unexploitable are the discredited. Since the system functions of credit, on credit, there are people whose credit is just not appreciated, who are considered uncredit worthy or credit less in the sense that nobody will invest in them. Right? Because another way of presenting, if you will, the, the contemporary condition is not only to say life is a portfolio, but maybe we should consider ourselves in our current condition situation as projects in search of investors. That's what we are. We are projects in search of investors. When you're looking for a job, basically you're looking for someone who, is, who will, you know, for a short time, since jobs are not secure anymore, invest in you. If you're looking for uh, a lender in order to buy a car or a house, you're looking for someone who's going to invest in the project that your life is. And you have to present your life as a valuable project so that it's credit worthy and so that you receive the money. Right? So that would be a profile of the condition. But some projects are just considered not credit. So what do you do with them? What happens to the discredited? So, and that's where I'm going to get to my new collective project that we're starting to work on. And which is centered not on a general condition of the discredited, but Europe. Because the European Union looking at the discredited in the European Union. And I think it's a very good field work, I mean, a very good terrain, a very good domain to, to, to contemplate that question, because um, in the general credit-worthy condition, uh, project in search for investment condition, Europe has two remarkable features, or three. I mean, first of all, it's still a relatively rich continent. European Union law. But it has these two specific features which are an aging population, probably aging quicker than any other part of the world, and an allergy to immigration that is growing as the population is aging. There's probably some kind of a little correlation between the two. But the correlation becomes a vicious circle. Because as the population ages and the xenophobia uh, increases, you close the door to immigration, but the birth rate is falling, uh, people are living longer and longer, so uh, the population is more and more aging and not enough people are coming in, so you have this sort of decrease of population. Which means that when you are in that situation of demographic decline or demographic or aging and demographic decline, how are you going to keep your credit up? Well, the main way you're going to keep your credit up is by trying to sustain, or if you're lucky, augment, increase, the ratio of capital to labor. Right? Since you don't want to stake your credit worthiness on demographic dynamism but by having young people come in, 
what you need is to have a higher rate of capital per individual in the continent in order to be creditworthy. So that you have to have a continent of people who attract lenders, or, or better still, who are lenders. Right? So that means that we have to face the fact that if Europe wants to be credit, remain credit worthy in our current environment, well, there are too many people. So, you know, especially young, poor people, not so good. So, it's not so bad. So, I don't mean that this is a plan that is deliberate. I don't mean that people behind closed doors decide, well, we have to eliminate a good section of the European population. But you have a multiplicity of local and regional rationality that amount, without a subject, if you will, a strategy without a subject, that they used to say in the 70s, that amounts to a rationality. And so the project there that we're starting to work on is to look at this European project of disposing of the discriminated. So what does it mean? It has several elements, which are all flexions of what Michel Foucault called biopolitics. Right? Uh, Michel Foucault, in the late 70s and early 80s, de developed this distinction between sovereignty and governmentality or sovereignty and biopolitics, saying that the power of the sovereign is the power to kill, ultimately, the power to take, or to let live. Modern governmentality, he said, or biopolitical governmentality, he said, is about making people live or sustaining and augmenting people life or letting them die. But it seems that in the current state of governmentality or relationship from techniques of government to biopolitics, there are different flexions. And especially in the case of the European project, you can see that as different flexions. For instance, the most evident one, which is really about a Foucault inflection of, of biopolitics, is what is happening in the Mediterranean where migrants are left to die. The boats of migrants are left to die. But they're not only left to die. They're left to die sometimes actively. There have been recent scandalous cases, the most horrible ones, one in 2011, another one in 2013, where, in fact, boats of migrants had sent uh, desperate messages uh, that they were sinking, their boat was sinking, or had caught fire. And clearly, it's been proved that boats, planes, helicopters from European countries got the message and didn't respond, and let this boat die. So there it's about letting them die. But of course, after the one of 2013, 360 uh, people who died, it was difficult to do nothing. So they developed this new project, which is mostly spearheaded by Italy, and which is called Mare Nostrum. And the project is a double project. And you'll see that in all these elements, there's always this remarkable double uh, idea, double standards and double idea. On the one hand, Mare Nostrum is about having technology to make sure that we catch the messages on time and we don't let these people drown and sink anyone. These boats sink and these people drown anymore. But at the same time, Mare Nostrum is a system of surveillance, the goal of which is the following. There is a line in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, sort of a virtual line in the Mediterranean Sea, beyond which, according to international law, if a boat 
in desperation goes beyond that line, it has to be brought to the European coast. So the ultimate goal of the technology is that the boats never get to that line. That they are pushed back to North Africa before they get to that line. And for that, you have the development of technology of surveillance. You have also boats that stop the boat in danger, but do not bring them to the coast, but wait just before the line until the countries in North Africa, Morocco, and Libya, particularly, with whom the European Union has special arrangements, send their own boats to reaccompany the migrants back to North Africa. So you have the development of a technology which is either leading people to die or making sure that they're pushed back from where they come from. And of course, the Ceuta and Meria is another reflection of that regime with the wall that's getting higher and higher and higher. For little results, because that doesn't stop the flow of migrants and it doesn't stop people from getting through. But the point is to carry out the message that uh, we want to limit the entrance as much as possible. So that's one segment of uh, this biopolitical policy. On the continental side, still on the migration side, but on the continental side, um, there is the case of the Roma population. And the particular uh, xenophobia and racism that is addressed to the Roma because the Roma present a problem that the other migrants don't present, that the non-European migrants don't present, is that the Roma are European. So uh, you can send them back to Romania and Bulgaria, but they can't come back. And in fact, they do. So there, the flexion of the policy is not to let them die, but to make their life impossible. And how do you make their life impossible? By forcing them to move all the time. And then you call them nomads, because, of course, they're expelled from one camp to the other. To complain about the fact that they cannot integrate in our country because they don't even send their children to school. How could they send their children to school if they're expelled from where they are every three months or every six months? Um, to claim that they're different because you know they don't have the same hygiene standards as we do because indeed the campgrounds are very dirty for the specific reason that usually the municipal services don't want to pick up the trash from around the campgrounds. So you have that way of making these people's life impossible, but you don't kill them. And you don't kill them because it would still be unsavory to kill them. Um, and by the same time, you don't know where to send them because if you send them to Romania and Bulgaria, they can come back. Uh, but little by little, they acquire a political capital, which is the fact that they are the lowest of the lowest. They are the most uncreditworthy, which is a way, a cheap way, of making people who already feel uncreditworthy to feel less uncreditworthy, at least compared to the Roma. Um, there's been, in France, for instance, there's been a surge of quasi-little pogroms against the Roma. And very often, um, the people who actually were involved in these pogroms, not always, but often, were people of coming from immigration. I mean, people from Arabic, African descent, Turkish descent, and so forth. And you can see that these people all of a sudden are treated with a lot of solicitude by the press, by the local government. Uh, and you can see that they, it's a way for them to present themselves as French. We're like you. Well, not maybe we're black, maybe we're Arabic, but we're like you. We, we hate the Roma too. So we're not like them, at least. So there is a political capital there as having like the people that are the ultimate low point of the European continent. And especially by expelling them all the time, you make them mobile, so you can use them in different 
region uh, of Europe and of France in this case. So this is another reflection of that European project. But it's not only about integration. Another way of making sure that the discredited don't appear without killing them is that they don't appear in statistics. And there's a remarkable development in unemployment or employment agencies, I don't know what you should call them, in employability agencies, of making sure that the unemployed disappear from the statistics. In fact, uh, there again, the, the work has been done in France mostly, but I'm sure it happens in other countries of Europe too. I mean, the, basically the services are trained to make sure that the people will be taken out of the statistics. You have rules that in order to be kept as a legitimate unemployed person, you have to come to all the appointments and you cannot refuse a job more than one or two times. So by multiplying the appointments, you multiply the possibility that people don't show up at one and so you can sort of discard them from the statistics. By offering them jobs that are supposedly part of their competence, but in fact are not, you can again have a criterion, well, I guess, you know, you've refused twice, so you're out of the statistics. But also you have other ways of multiplying things that are not exactly jobs, but which are sort of training programs, unpaid, but that you have a new norm that people who are doing that are not in the unemployment statistics. So it's a way of limiting the unemployment, and of course that's a way of making the country Creditworthy, in other words, a country that doesn't have that much employment uh, is more creditworthy for the people who are going to lend money and buy the national debt. So that's a third element of um, that politics. A fourth element of the politics, which happened in certain countries, particularly in Portugal, in Ireland, uh, in Greece also, and now in Spain, but in a less official way, is, uh, since you have to eliminate people, is to push people to migrate, to leave the country. Right? Ireland, for instance, is very proud that it got out of the crisis, the good, nice, tough, austerity way, uh, and that even unemployment is down. Indeed, unemployment is down because since 2008, 10% of the Irish population has left Ireland, of the working Irish population. In Portugal, uh, in the year 2012, uh, in a country of a little more than 10 million uh, people, there were about 10,000 people leaving Portugal every month. Okay. So, and there, the government is really pushing officially for migration. Right. At the same time, for the space made by the people who are pushed to migrate, some countries, and there again, Portugal is at the head of that, is making special case to attract rich retirees from Northern Europe and United States. There's a new law in Portugal, like if you're rich enough and you're retired and you have a private pension that the state doesn't have to pay for, that the Portuguese state doesn't have to pay for, you don't have to pay income taxes for five to ten years. That's a you, you wonder, I mean, why do they attract them? Well, these people will buy real estate, and so the price of real estate will go up, and so therefore uh, Portugal will become more credit worthy through that. So you basically replace young, working, trained, for the most part, and educated people by old, retired people with money. So, that's another section of the policy. And the last one, which is, I mean, the last one so far, but if you have others to offer, I'll be happy to take them, um, is, this time it's more of a private sector initiative, is to push employees to suicide. I mean, the neoliberal management uh, has been particularly strenuous, but there's been a development of uh, making sure that people's jobs are constantly in jeopardy, but also 
the, the most interesting way, I mean, the most perverse and, and brilliant way of uh, developing this kind of uh, elimination of people that, you know, uh, what stockholder like is a valuable asset with low labor cost after all, so you have to eliminate uh, some of the people who don't generate much asset value. So the way you do it, and that's a remarkable um, schizophrenia of neoliberal management, is that you insist on teamwork. You know, the old days of a company where there were sort of strict hierarchies, there was the boss and then people underling, and that's over. Now we're all a team. We're all in this together. But at the same time as you develop this sort of ethic of teamwork, you make the jobs more and more precarious, on one hand, and you constantly evaluate the teams, and you put different teams within the company in competition. So, and of course, if you don't make it in the evaluation, you're expelled, or you risk being expelled. And of course, because you've been informed with this ethic of teamwork, you feel that it's your fault if you're expelled because you are not enough of a team player. So that, plus the constant change of assignation and of job, creates a remarkable wave of suicide. And there again, France is at the forefront in the development of, of, of suicide. And especially what is interesting is that the, the, the big companies where the rate of suicide is the highest are the companies that have been recently privatized. In other words, former public companies which were uh, at least in principle uh, concerned with uh, the value for the user of public good or public services or if you are anti-administration not working too much and making sure that you, 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 you're not pressured too much, the change to the privatization and the pressure has created uh, an amazing wave of suicide. So that's another way of uh, eliminating people. So I think it is important, and that's the project to come, to not present it as a hazard or a tragic consequence of various policies, but to sort of weave them together and show that there is a coherent and consistent European project at work with its various elements and various components. And you can see what the utopia is. The utopia is to, little by little, transform Europe into a gated communities for old, white retirees. But let's not forget, it's a utopia. It's a little bit of a dream, but at least it gives energy and, and, and direction to the European governments and the European corporations. Thanks very much for this uh, terrific bit of our near future. Um, I mean, in fact, I mean, it, it is the, the piece I was expecting to listen to you. And, uh, you know, I mean, you'll see when Alejandra also delivers her talk, I mean, she's, going, she's again going to speak about those who came to our countries. And, yet we think that there is no place for them. So, I mean, it, I mean, at the end of the morning, I guess, I mean, everything is going to sound even more consistent. But yet, I mean, I would like, I would really like you to expand a little bit more on those policies to get rid of the redundant population. Okay. Of the redundant population. It is my own term, if you want, I mean, to call these people who, after the statistics, say, yet yeah, that's not, I mean, there's no more capability to simulate any more population. And if we do a little bit of history about the way this 200 population 
is being treated. I mean, we should go back to the international uh, wars between Tutsis, etc., when you know, I mean, one ethnic group was actually uh, decimating another ethnic group. And then, seen in a larger perspective, I mean, one could actually attribute those uh, international wars to a general attachment of global capital, you know, I mean, reducing this redundant population in the very original countries, you know, in Rwanda. I mean, and again, our absent poets, Achille and Bende, he wanted to describe these sort of practices as an adjustment in, in global capital in attempting to reduce this redundant population. Uh, but the problem is, that, uh, as you remarkably have observed, I mean, when, when, when these people are already here, I mean, what do we do with those bodies, with, uh, with that presence? You know, that according to our statistics, there's no place. And even though they occupy a place, they have no place in them. And uh, the, the, the way you describe that sort of, uh, you know, policy by which they cannot kill, of course, you know, but they have to remain in a sort of limbo. I mean, this practical limbo, I mean, it, it is kind of interesting to realize that when the religious discourse eliminated the concept of the limbo, the last one declared the limbo anymore non-existent in any way. It was eliminated from the vocabulary of the theology. Right? It reappears in, 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 in the civil politics because these people are sent not to a, I mean, are not part of Europe. They are in a limbo, which is inscribed somehow in Europe. But, but the question, uh, Michel, is I mean, again, I mean, going back to your uh, collaborative work with Saint Francois, I mean, what, what are the dispositives? I mean, to articulate a representation of their presence. I mean, we know already what the governments do to them. But what can the rest of the population do? I mean, how can they really incorporate the that representation of the civil population? Is the civil still, I mean, the, the, the framework in which they will be inspired? Or do we have to also rephrase Rethink our own sort of uh, you know, I mean, civilian framework to accommodate them. Two or three things. Um, first of all, I mean, you mentioned. I mean, it's it's a side thing, but you mentioned one of them. I, th I think we have to be careful at the same time, even though I've been guilty of it myself with this presentation, uh, not to eliminate any form of specific conflict by putting, by subsuming it under the general evolution of capitalism. I mean, who to power slaughtered and the government slaughtered the Tutsis and the Hutus that were opposing them, not global capitalism. Right? I remember uh, at the moment of um, the Yugoslavian war, uh, Slavoj Zizek saying that what we should do is to go and protest at the IMF and the World Bank because they are responsible for the disaster of Yugoslavia. Maybe they are at a certain level, but at this point it's a certain militia who are bombing Sarajevo, not the IMF. So there are moments when uh, the, the, the local and the specific shouldn't be forgotten and subsumed under uh, general dispositive, even though I'm certainly guilty of delivering uh, general dispositive. Um, well, what you're asking is two things. It's true that um, there's something problematic in my new project from my own point of view. Uh, meaning from the point of view of my own work, which is this. Um, my work on the neoliberal condition, even though it's, I, I have more and more problem calling it the neoliberal condition because uh, 
it is a neoliberal condition in the sense that it's been a product of neoliberal action, but it's not in the sense that it's not the product of the neoliberal intention. So it's, it's a little complicated, but for ease, let's still call it a neoliberal condition. The reason why I'm, I've been working on that, I mean, one of the reasons why I've been working on that is to sort of assess and try to understand what are the forms of activism that are adequate to that. Uh, and my claim, and that's where usually I start losing friends, uh, my claim is that instead of rejecting our condition, we need to appropriate it. In other words, instead of rejecting with horror the fact that we're treated as project looking for credit, I think we have to embrace that condition, but change the condition of accreditation. In other words, uh, try to have forms of action that will change the conditions under which and the criteria according to which credit is allotted, is attributed. In other words, the issue is not, the problem is not credit, but the problem is who is giving credit to and for what. Right? So, you know, in the same way that in the liberal world, the, the, the stake was the apportioning of income. How much goes to dividend, how much goes to labor income. And the social struggle was on the apportioning of the product. Right? At this point, the main, even though that struggle has not disappeared, of course, but you could see in the, in the theatrical representation yesterday how it's difficult to construct a form of activism based on that and how it doesn't resonate anymore. Because I think there's been a shift of the battlefield basically from the labor market where the tensions are between who's going to get the product, who's going to get, which, how is going to the, the product going to be allotted, how the income is going to be apportioned between, uh, in, between labor and capital. It has shifted from there to the capital market, to the financial market, where the issue is not so much the apportionment of the income, but the allocation of capital, the allocation of resources. In other words, what gets credit and what doesn't get credit. Who and what is credit worthy and who and what is not. And I think the struggle has to be there. And so the idea of causes and causes are developing because you know you, you can see the, the, the film and theatrical representation of yesterday and have the impression that all form of activism has disappeared. But that isn't true. There are activisms that are very much alive. They're usually not based on that form of uh, trade union labor approach. And precisely, the point is to find out what form of uh, activism is adequate to the world of credit and to that struggle for uh, accreditation. So that's a good deal of my work. Clearly here, uh, probably out of desperation, we indulge in something which is more or less Jonathan Swift, modest proposal, you know, eating the Irish children to deal with the famine in Ireland. So that project has something to do with that. The, the hope is that turning from critique of various European policies to, in a way, an ironic applaud to the coherence and the rationality of an overall project can have kind of a, a chilling effect, at least, which could then produce some kind of mobilization or this discussion uh, about it. I think to sort of present it as a rationality, as a positive rationality, and not as the horrible results of misguided policy. So, but I agree that it is a limited uh, and, and essentially critical uh, political move and not a move that has to do with mobilizing or trying to weave different forms of, of activism. So that's, yes, that's the limitation of that project. But it's true that we're not in very good shape for the moment. So at least indulging in some swift and irony seems to be like a way of sort of regaining at least the energy before we go on more productive things. Preguntas, cuestiones. Es pronto, aún. Si no hay preguntas urgentes, yo creo que.
que igual después de la intervención de Alejandra, si eh, va a hacer lo que espero que haga, seguramente surgirán nuevas preguntas que igualmente no voy a dirigir a, a Michelle. Así que si va a lo que parece, vamos con Alejandra. Bueno, gracias. Gracias,